Okay, so uh, welcome to this session and uh, let's get started with Paolo Perone talking about uh, Markov categories and entropy. Okay, can you hear me online? All right. Uh, we're going to talk about Markov categories and entropy. So uh, I'm sure by now most of you have heard a lot about Markov categories. I don't have to tell you what they are. Maybe let's spend a little bit more time about entropy. Um, let's see. All right. So we saw already Markov categories have these copy and discard maps such that discard is natural because it's semi-Cartesian and the object commonoids, and we also saw that uh, the main examples for the purposes of probability are probably Finstock, which is the category of stochastic matrices, and Stock, which is the category of Markov kernels with <coughs> composition, okay? Uh, I guess we heard it, at least for half of you in the tutorial yesterday, and then in like Two more talks today, so I will not spend more time about telling you what Finstock and Stock are. But maybe it is a little bit hard to call some concepts of independence and the like, which were in the tutorial yesterday, but it's good to recall them, and not everybody was in the tutorial. So, joint state, meaning that it has two outputs, so the monoidal, un the monoidal product of the outputs, uh, exhibits independence of these two outputs if it is the product of the marginals. So the marginals are formed by like discarding what you're not interested in. In the case of Finstock, that's just amounts to like, in this case, for example, summing over Y or integrating over Y in the continuous case, forgetting about it. Joint state is, let me say, uh, decomposable or splittable into this product. Like imagine you can draw a line here and split these two if it denotes uh, independence. So if you can write that this product, and uh, as some of you saw yesterday, this has this idea that X and Y in general are random, but knowing what X is, or observing X, has something to tell you about Y. Like when you can assume that you don't have to have cohesion, for example. Like you can condition on X and learn something about why in case you have conditionals that turns into an actual model. Okay? So you can do some inference. And similarly, a joint morphism that now has an input exhibits conditional independence if, well, again, you can split it, but you have to like share the input. So if you want to see in, uh, in, in stock, that amounts to say again that the conditional probability is a product of conditional probabilities given the input, but you see A here is used twice, the same A, so you gotta copy it, all right? So again, the idea is here that, generally you could make some predictions about Y if you know X, but if you know A, then there's really nothing that X has on Y. Like, there's nothing about Y that you can learn from X if you already know A, and here, you can view this graphically by saying that the path from X to Y passes through A. Okay, so Y and, y and X do have some dependence, but this dependence factors through A. Okay, so knowing A will. Okay, so um, similarly, uh, uh, mm, yes, uh, Dario, could I use that mic? Because this one is again. All right, I hope it's better now. Um, okay, so we also saw what determinism is. So amorphism is deterministic. Okay, in terms of conditional independence is if this one with P and like copy, so P and perfect correlation over both entries splits, okay? And you can prove it was even in one of the exercises yesterday that in Finstock, this just says that the entries of the probability are either zero or one, so you are perfectly certain 
at least we're almost certain, about which events happen and which events don't, as you imagine for determinism. And um, amorphism is deterministic similarly if the conditional distribution has zeros or one. So basically, like in, in the most important cases, if it's, the, it's if it's a function and not a kernel. Like you know exactly where A is going to map to. So A is going to map to some elements of X with some probabilities, and you know exactly the one it will be mapped to, and everything else is zero. Okay? And again, you can view this case as like splitting F in the sense of conditional independence. Okay, so are there questions until now? Because now we're going to use these quite, quite extensively. Seems <coughs> not. All right. Um, again, I talked about this yesterday a little bit. It was in one of the bonus exercises. Uh, these three conditions are, are equivalent, and part of this was also in Elena's talk this morning. Oh, uh, there's a question. All right. Um, okay. So, a category is Cartesian monoidal if and only if everything is deterministic, and I guess by now you all know that. What is a little bit less obvious is that that's also equivalent to say that everything is independent. Okay? So we saw yesterday that the fact that you can have correlations is an inevitable consequence of randomness. And what we're seeing here is also a little bit the opposite. Of like, like randomness is kind of a consequence of the fact that things can have some stochastic dependence. Like you see, uh, if not, we wouldn't have this like wiggle room to have the difference into both sides of the determinism equation. So let's maybe sketch the proof here, which uh, might spoil part of yesterday's exercises, but I guess by now nobody wants to attempt them. So how do you go from one to two? Um, all right, so if, F exhibits conditional independence between X and itself, then it splits. And you get this. And now with just the comonoid things, you can copy in this car, so you just get this. And that proves that F is deterministic. All right? So, in some sense, determinism is just conditional independence with itself. Conversely, if every morphism is deterministic, then take a joint morphism, you can just copy and discard because it's nothing. But now you see now this is F and copying, and by determinism, that's copying and an F. And that's exactly saying that these two are the same. Okay? So, if there's no correlation, there is no randomness. If there's no randomness, there is no correlation. And you might think, okay, this is basically a statement about information theory rather than probability. It's about where things interact or not. In information theory, you would say that if there's entropy, if there's no entropy, there's no mutual information, and the other way around. But of course, that is quantitative. This is just qualitative for now. So, what I want to say in this talk is that we can do information theory this way. And it's very much compatible with Markov category to the point that, um, in some sense, information theorists are already thinking a little bit in terms of Markov categories. So, what is information theory for people that don't know? I mean, of course, what is some aspects of information theory? It's a huge field. The idea is that you want to quantify the amount of information flow and randomness between some inputs and outputs of a channel. Okay? That's how it was born. There are a few measures of how random things are. The most famous one is Shannon's entropy. Uh, we will do finite sets for all this talk. So take your finite sets and the uh, discrete then probability measure on it. This number, which is always non-negative, is a measure of how random things are. I'm going to show you a graph in a moment. I hope it's going to make some sense. There are a lot of characterizations that determine this quantity uniquely. Some of them are categorical and rather beautiful, if you ask me. But this is not the only measure quantifying randomness. For example, Rene entropies, they depend on a parameter alpha, and they are quantified quantities that work in a similar way by quantifying randomness. We also have that if, if alpha is one, this is obviously not defined, but in the limit it is, and it tends to Shannon's entropy. So you can view Rene's entropy as a deformation, if you want, of Shannon's entropy. So here's what they look like. You see here we have 
all the probabilities over a two element set, so first element with probability one and the second one zero, the other one and everything in between. And you see it has this like concave shapes with a peak at the distribution that has the most uncertainty, okay? And the other ones for different alphas look like this. So you see they're like, again, minimal at the deterministic ones, well, zero and maximal here. They differ in like how fast they grow, basically, okay? In particular, for alpha larger than two, it ceases to be concave. You see here, you get it's a little bit like non-concave, but it still has nice properties. And for alpha instead tending to zero, it becomes something that's just straight. So it basically factors through the support of the distribution. So it's like zero here, zero here, and one in the middle. Okay, so I hope this captures the intuition of saying uh, it cap it like uh, quantify how random things are, and depending on what you want to do, you may want to like uh, count these intermediate values a little bit differently. Okay. So other things you can do in information theory is um, try to quantify how different the distribution is from another one. Uh, so the easiest way is to to use a metric between distributions, such as the total variation distance, which is literally just the L1 difference of uh, distributions. But in statistics and information theory, some people, sometimes you want to use quantities that do not satisfy triangle inequality and are not symmetric, such as the kullback leibler divergence. So this one comes up very naturally if you do like large deviations theory, for example. Or even if you like uh, study like uh, Bayesian inference and you want to look at updating. So these quantities kind of like fall into your hands if you work with this and they do not satisfy triangle inequalities. So you might want to do some theory with them and axiomatize some quantities that do not satisfy the triangle inequality. And so again, you have a Renidia of the emergence. That's the formation of this one. It tends to this one for alpha 10 into one. Here are some examples of divergences between P, where P varies, and the distribution in the middle. You see that, of course, they're all zero in the middle, but again, they grow with different speeds as you move away. In particular, TV, remember, it has an absolute value, so it's piecewise linear, but not smooth, and the other ones are smooth, okay? And again, how fast you want to grow, that depends on the application you have in mind. All right, why do we want to quantify distances between probability measures? Well. Here's the main example, because for example, we want to quantify how far our joint distribution is from displaying independence. Because we want to quantify the amount of interaction, the amount of correlation. All right, so if you take the divergence, people usually take the KL divergence between P and the product of its marginals. Well, that's a measure of independence, and it's actually a rather nice one. So if you see here, for example, here we have, uh, I chose the number such that it's the same graph as before, but of course in general they're different, but the intuition is the same. So here we have probability distribution over products of two element sets. In this one, you see we are on the diagonal, so we have perfect correlation, but randomness 50-50, here inverse, and here we have uh, independence. And you see all these quantities go down to zero here, and then again grow with different rates, and they're maximal when the perfect correlation is uh, in either direct or inverse correlation. It doesn't matter from the point of view of information. So when this is maximal, knowing one of the two will tell you exactly everything about the other one. And here instead, knowing one of the two will tell you nothing about the other one. Okay? So you see, that's a little bit like what we were doing in Markov categories, saying like you can infer, uh, say if something is independent or if something is random, except that now we have numbers, so we can quantify how far we are from these cases, right? And uh, of course, uh, in information theory, you don't just have like definitions of these quantities, you can like prove stuff between them. So you can prove, for example, that uh, processing data deterministically can only reduce randomness and also reduce the number of interactions. In particular, if X and Y are independent, or if this is zero, then processing them independently will keep them independent we will get uh, that in Shannon entropy is some kind of self-information if you put personal correlation, and Rini entropy has a similar thing, but different alphas. And we also have here that 
Um, if something is, again, imagine these are zero, so something is not random, then it also displays conditional independence. And remember, we saw that for Markov categories. And so what I want to argue is that this is basically Markov categories, except in quantitative version, okay? Some of you might already see exactly how this is gonna work. If not, well, bear with me, we have to make some definitions. So, a divergence on a Markov category is a diversion on each home set, so on the arrows, in particular on the states. So like on the probability measures and on the kernels of your Markov categories. So remember, imagine a metric, except you might not have the triangle inequality, with these two compatibility properties. The first one tells you that the distance between the sequential compositions is less or equal than the distance between the components. So it's something like a vertical triangle inequality, but it has nothing to do with making this divergence a metric, like the triangle is somewhere else. And same for the second one, that one is the same thing, but for parallel composition. So it's a condition on the tensor product. So the distance between the tensor products is less or equal than the distance between the factors. Okay? Um, these two things are enough to do everything we want. There's some kind of, I want to say, quantitative coherence theorem. Uh, so there's two ways to interpret these two conditions, and I want to argue they're not arbitrary. First one is a, let me say, pure category theory interpretation. This is enriching our Markov category in the category of divergent spaces. What's a divergent space? Well, it's a space, it's a set equipped with a divergence, and we want, let me say, short maps, like if it was a metric, it would be a short map. So not increasing for the emergence. With the L1 monoidal product. And for internal home, you have to be a little bit careful because... So the triangle inequality is something like a quantitative transitivity, right? So a divergent space is to a metric space as a graph is to a transitive graph. So when you construct the internal harm you need a quantitative version of what you usually do for non-transitive graphs so definitely not for like posets or for categories because those are like transitive and so you have to construct this enriched version of the graph exponential but then that, that gives you a closed monoidal category and you can enrich c in it and monoidal is so what does it mean monoidal is so well this is the condition that the composition is an enriched morphism, and this one is the composition, is the condition that the tensor product is an enriched functor, okay? So we are enriching a monoidal category in depth. So that's one motivation, but this is not CT, this is ACT. So what's the applied interpretation of this condition? Well, I wanna say that this is a quantitative version of the compositionality principle, meaning that Take two configurations, here I've drawn them with like three blocks because the slides have a limited size, but imagine even something extremely complicated. No matter how much you copy, discard, uh, take the sequential composition, parallel composition of something super complex, then the distance between the two compositions is always less or equal than the distance between the components. In particular, that implies that if all components are the same except one, then a variation in one of the components is not gonna give you a huge variation overall. So it's something like non-chaotic behavior, okay? Now, of course, you might imagine that uh, you don't only want to compare things that have this exact form. So maybe G prime is itself the sequential composition of something and G is itself the parallel composition of something. What do you do in that case? Well, you pattern match until you can, and you still get a bound. And you might even pattern match in different ways, and you get a bound for each one of those configurations. Okay? And, um, all right. So, that's suggestive. In order to work with this particular mark of categories, we need an equivalent characterization, which is closer to what people actually do in information theory. So you can prove that these are equivalent conditions to the above. And we can even simplify these, because usually in information theory, you have a distance between the, say, like states or probability measures, but you also, like for channels, you just maximize over the inputs, and that's what you do. So if we maximize over the input to find the distances, 
the characterization is just this one, which you see, the first one is basically saying that marginals have less distance than the whole thing. So if you want, it's like a monotonicity condition in the number of observed variables. And the second condition is saying that if you form a joint distribution through a marginal and the conditional, then the distance between these is less or equal than the distance of the components here. So they're basically a monotonicity condition and something that looks a lot like a generalized chain rule. Like if, if here we had a sum or like a convex combination, this would be exactly the chain rule of, a, of uh, the KL divergence. So people look at these quantities in information theory and so this allows our formalism to talk to the existing thing. So that the KL divergence, the Rainy divergence, and the total relational distance give you indeed divergences on Finstock. Also on stock, if you replace sums by integrals and do things right, but uh, it's in the paper if you want, I'm not gonna talk about it here because you need to do quite some measured theory to get the things right, like Radon, Nicodem, and other things. But the interpretation is the same. Curiously, Salis's Q divergences instead do not work at least not for generic Q. All right, um, so let's use these. Uh, remember, independence means that these two things are equal. Then in general, we can like measure how far we are from this case. So take the divergence between both members of the equation, that gives you exactly mutual information. That's also exactly how information theorists use mutual information. It's the distance between two cases, exactly those two that appear in our equation for Markov categories. More interestingly, if you look at entropy, well, randomness is this, right? The, like randomness is zero if these are equal, so take the distance, like divergence between the two. And uh, this is less famous in information theory, so what does this give us? Well, for D being the KL division, we get exactly Shannon entropy. For the Rene mutual information, we got a measure of entropy out of a different alpha, as I said before, but still a way to quantify like um, randomness. And for a total relation distance, uh, you can do the math and you get this quantity, which, okay, in in quantum information theory, it's called linear entropy. Of course, in quantum information theory, you don't have these, you get like, have like density matrices, but like it's similar to what in the quantum case is called linear entropy, because you see it's kind of like entropy, except that instead of P and then minus log, a, log P, you have a linearization of it, one minus P. So it's called linear entropy there. Um, but it's also used in ecology because uh, it's, uh, it measures diversity of your like ecosystem. And uh, here it's what it looks like. So these are the measures of entropy and the Gene Simpson coefficient looks like one of those curves. So you see that if you have know, two species in your environment, then the diversity, so to say, is maximized if uh, we are in the middle, just like before, okay? So all these quantities that you see on this graph can arise naturally as just divergences your mark of category if we, instead of talking about determinism and independence, um, well, we just measure the distance from that case, okay? Um, moreover, uh, this principle of compositionality that I said um, is a massive generalization of all the data processing inequalities and implies all these conditions uh, for F and G deterministic. So, in particular, this gives you a monotonicity condition on the number of observed variables for like the divergence, for mutual information, and for entropy. So it's something like uh, the context in which all these data processing inequalities hold. It's like uh, they're all aspects of like this like enriched categorical framework and these all follow simply from that one axiom, which again we've proved for this class of divergences. All right, um, so I'm almost done. This is um, the very beginning of trying to get information theory and uh, Markov categories to talk one another. There's one paper out, there's a lot more work to be done. So what are the main things that we wonder? Uh, first of all, all this uh, involved Finstock. In the paper, you can see I also work with Borel stock, but the stuff that you recover is, for example, not differential entropy. 
And the reason is because, uh, well, one of the reasons is because, say, the differential entropy of a Dirac delta is minus infinity, not zero. So it's definitely not the distance from anything. But also, and more interestingly, Gaussians of different variances have different differential entropies. But those things, as measure spaces, are isomorphic because their scaling map is, a, is an isomorphism of measure spaces. So it's an isomorphism of Borel stock. So the question is, all right, to get differential entropy, do you need to enrich which Markov category? And, uh, well, we don't know. So that's one of the things we want to look into, like how to talk, for example, about like densities and stuff like that in this framework. Another thing we wonder is, okay, so using enrichment, we can talk about diagrams to commute only up to epsilon. Can we make some theorems about like limits and co-limits in categorical probability quantitative in this way? So Kolmogorov extension theorem tells you that the joint is determined uniquely by the finite marginals. Great. Is the distance between two joints bounded by the distance between the finite marginals? We don't know. And the second one, uh, third one is, uh, okay, we looked at the divergence from the case of products of independence, but that's of course one case. There is a lot of other configurations, which could be our like base case, and we might want to see how far we are from that particular configuration. People do that a lot in statistics and like machine learning, with, for example, exponential families. So is there a nice categorical story there too? It's probably the same thing as for a product, just uh, with a lot more combinatorics involved, but again, that's something that remains to be done. Um, all right, so I'll stop here. Let me just tell you, you can find all that I said and more in this preprint here, lift and coupling in master science space. Uh, sorry, no, this one. Mark of categories and entropy. All right. Thanks a lot. Is there anything uh, that, that you can add that would tie it down to just the callback wiper divergence? Help the callback wiper divergence. Um, um, yes, it's not part of my work, but um, so there's a paper by I think John Bass, Tobias Fritz, and Tom Lester called uh, a characterization of relative entropy, a Bayesian characterization of relative entropy, or something like that. I hope the authors are the right ones. Uh, yeah, Tom Lester might or might not be there. And so in there, they give like the perfect uh, categorical characterization of But that's, what's like, that's quite different from your framework. I was wondering what, like... Oh, if one can characterize it in terms of Markov categories. Um, no, I mean, I haven't done it. I believe that their argument can be like recycled and cast into this notation, but I haven't done it. So uh, I can't say for now.